Hello everybody and welcome to this evening's Insight event. Today we are celebrating International Day of People with Disabilities, so welcome. My name is Nathan Gearing and I will be chairing this event um, this evening. I, am, I was the Artistic Director of the Special Olympics opening ceremony in 2017 and I'm also the creator of the Rationale Method of Audio Description. I go by the pronouns of he and him and in terms of my physical description, I am mixed race, so I'm uh, half black and half white. I have about two inches worth of Afro hair on the top of my head and a you know, smooth uh, haircut around, around the edges. It's nice and short. Uh, I have a, a short beard that's also black. I am wearing a bright orange uh, sweater, which has a kind of a smooth feel to it. So, so a bit like a shh kind of sound really nice kind of smooth feel to it, but it has a kind of like a brown patchwork uh, pocket on my uh, left chest. And that's a bit more of a rougher texture. So it's a bit more of like a kind of like a rough texture as you move your fingers along it. Um, but, but yeah, that's uh, my, my, my description of myself. Um, tonight, we're going to be uh, delving uh, really deep into how we can have a truly disability inclusive art sector moving forwards as we start to recover from the impact of uh, COVID-19. And I have an absolutely incredible uh, panel with me that are really gonna help us like dig deep to see how we can really try and evoke meaningful uh, uh, positive movement and change within the sector. So without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, each panelist up to just give a brief introduction of themselves and just to talk a little bit about their practice as well as give a, a, a bit of a physical description. So if we could start with uh, Alan. Hello, uh, thanks for this invitation. I am happy to be here. I am uh, opera singer and I had the great opportunity to sing uh, last September and October with the uh, opera, with the opera house in Magic Flute, and to working with all of my colleagues, my coachings, my coaches of uh, Yes Parte Young Artist Program. So thank you for this invitation, thank you. And Alan, could you give a little bit of a description of, you, of yourself? Of course. Uh, now I am with uh, 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 white white shirt. I am uh, sit front of uh, pianoforte of the pianoforte because it's uh, is the best uh, position for me, and uh, I have uh, um, I, I I have uh, I have uh, cut uh, cut hair, and uh, my I think my my uh, color of uh, skin is like. Can I say like brown <laughs> in my imagination? I think. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, Joe, if you could uh, introduce yourself, please. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe. I'm a white cis man in his early 20s. I have dark, bushy hair that's really long at the moment and needs a haircut. Um, I also have dark eyebrows. Um, I'm wearing a very thick woolen dark sweater um, and my pronouns are he, him. I'm a freelance dance artist and I specialise in ballet. I use crutches and a wheelchair and I was very lucky to have worked with the Royal Ballet for the Paralympic homecoming ceremony and I've just finished a UK tour with Ballet Cymru in Wales, in Giselle. Brilliant, amazing, amazing. Um, Elizabeth? Hi everyone, um, I'm Elizabeth Arifian and my pronouns are she, her. Um, my hair is a, a dyed kind of red orange color uh, and it goes down to kind of midway on my, my arm. Um, I'm wearing a black silk shirt and um, it's very soft to feel. Um, I have light, light skin, uh, quite white, pale skin. And um, I'm joining today uh, from 
a company I co-founded with Charlotte Edmonds called Move Beyond Words. And we amplify the voices of those with dyslexia within the creative sector. And we do that through uh, workshops, films, live performances, a podcast, um, and soon to be workshops as well in the new year. Wicked, absolutely amazing. And Andrew? Thanks, Nathan, and, and evening, everyone. Delighted to be with you. Um, I'm a middle-aged white male, he, him, wheelchair user, wearing glasses and a tartan jumper. I'm sitting in my studio in Northamptonshire in front of a bright orange blind. I'm a cultural consultant and broadcaster. I've been working across the cultural industries for about 30 odd years, and I'm a national council member of Arts Council England, governor of the Royal Shakespeare Company, chair of the BFI, Disability Screen Advisory Board, trustee of BAFTA and Welsh National Opera. Uh, and I also co-created the UK Disability Arts Alliance. We shall not be removed last year. Wow. See, I told you we had an incredible group of panellists, right? They've all achieved such incredible, amazing stuff. OK, so um, just to let the audience at home know, if you have any questions at, at any point, if you want to just uh, pop the questions into the comments section, what we will do is towards the end of the panel discussion, we will try and um, answer as many of those questions as, as we possibly can. But right now, we're going to jump into uh, some, some questions um, that's been prepared especially uh, for, this, for this panel. So the first question is, what are the major benefits to a disability inclusive sector? Are there any kind of like benefits that the audience at home may not even be aware of? Um, and I'd like to pose that question uh, first to Joe. Yeah, so I believe um, for me, the major benefits are it's really exciting um, to have integration in things. So I find it really exciting to learn from one another. And I think what's really important as well is with the arts, with audiences watching them, you want to see a true representation of, you know, the people around us in the world. And I think if you don't have that true representation, you won't be able to inspire the next generation. So I think it's really important that you have someone that you can identify with and be like, yes, I can do it as well. Um, but I think it's really important that we also learn from one another too. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, Elizabeth? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, an extremely valid point. And, you know, there, there are approximately 14 million people in the UK with disabilities. So we're a, a massive part of the population and we'll normalise differences the more that we're seeing ourselves reflected out in, in mainstream culture and media. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Uh, Andrew? Uh, I, yeah, I'd agree with all of that. Um, I mean, deaf, disabled, neurodiverse people make up over 20% of this country's population and around 12% of the pre-pandemic arts audience in England. Uh, and the campaign I founded, We Shall Not Be Removed, had disabled members representing every role and capacity in the creative industries. So it's simply wrong that we are not represented in the art sector as artists, as employees, uh, as we should be. Disabled talent is out there, but very often it's opportunity that isn't. Mm, yeah, yeah, so true, so true. Uh, Alan? I would say uh, that uh, it's impressive. I agree with all of, all, all of you. And uh, I, I would say also, uh, one of the benefits is, uh, as Joe said, uh, the integration that we can have uh, between all of us, uh, all the things that we can learn, because uh, I think uh, every, everyone, it, uh, we, can, we can learn different things about, um, about music, about the ballet, about uh, uh, how can we, in, in this disability things, how can we, especially, uh, we, we act, for example, that how can we perform in the, on stage uh, the, the, the different things? So I think it's, uh, it's 
really great to have uh, this benefit and to have this inclusion because um, every every in, in Mexico we say every every person is uh, have different thoughts and have different world in their inside their minds minds so I think um, uh, it's really interesting to learn uh, each other by different people. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It is. It's like the more the more people that there are around the table, the more the more chance for new and exciting things to be discovered and new perspectives to be kind of like you know approached. And yeah, I just think it just will definitely create like a a, a richer hotbed for for creativity and inclusion within the arts if everybody is at the table and um, and has the opportunity. Um, Andrew, you. You touched on uh, this next question a little bit in, in when you answered the last one, actually. Um, what for you is the biggest barrier to a truly disability inclusive art sector? Uh, well, for me, the, the, the biggest barrier is a lack of understanding about ableism. And outside of the disability community, ableism is still really a very largely unfamiliar term. But assuredly, as racism, misogyny, homophobia, ableism is a major barrier and wrecks opportunities for disabled people. Ableism applies to a wide range of situations and settings from limited physical access to a limited understanding of the support deaf, neurodiverse, disabled people need to succeed. It also acts as a conditioning agent inhabiting, uh, inhibiting disabled people's um, uh, ambitions and non-disabled people's expectations of what uh, disabled people can do so for me ableism is a major barrier yeah 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 definitely um and how do you feel that we can um overcome that what steps do you feel we can um, start to make to to ob overcome ableism we need to recognize what it is um uh, society needs to recognize what it is um and there needs to be an open conversation about it uh and in fact yesterday uh, one of the organizations I'm involved with, the BFI, uh, published a film uh, about uh, ableism in the film and TV sectors. Um, and that's been published on the BFI website. And there's lots of information online about what ableism is. And I think it's important to recognize it to then be able to do something about it and remove it from working methods. Yeah, definitely. Definitely agree. Um, Elizabeth? Um, I did something, and I, I think it's important to share, actually, because I think it's an actual barrier in itself. But um, I read that question differently <laughs> from how, and, and also the way that you'd articulated it, I would processed it differently. So I think that's something worth sharing as a barrier um, personally is processing information and and having that information um, delivered in a way that's accessible to me, which um, is a, more of a personal barrier as opposed to, um, you know, how we how we take those next steps. So, um, yeah, I thought that was important to share. Yeah, definitely. And so could you tell us um, how you interpreted that, that, that question or how that question came, came across to you then when, when, when you uh, first received it? Yeah, so I kind of I read that as um, or processed it and, and read it in the notes um, as the the biggest barrier that I face as an as a individual um, kind of in the sector. So it's, it's so slight, but um, it's interesting because those those small barriers make such a huge difference. Um, and, you know, in an application form or in a. Um, you know, an evaluation or something like that, that information can, if it's not delivered in an accessible way, can create um, just wrong, wrong information or, or you're delivering um, information that you, isn't quite right. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's quite interesting how, how we're all processing information. Great. Uh, and, and just to, to follow up on that. So, what what ways in which could like for example the audience at home um be mindful of and what ways could they make their information more accessible 
Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's it. It's, I'm glad you're asking that question. I think there's, there's so many different ways and they're, they're quite easy ways that we can make information more accessible. For instance, in an email, um, if you're sending a, a huge email with lots of information, just bullet point in those messages that you want to get across, um, making sure that, that, that your sentences are concise um, and that the information and the way that you're articulating things is just really clear and direct. Um, I think people like myself with ADHD and dyslexia, we, we kind of, we, we don't work well with, um, you know, blurred lines. We, we just need information to be nice and clear and concise. So just small things like that, you know, bullet points, um, being in communication with one another about what your, your needs are. There's great resources out there. Um, that can support with that, such as uh, Access Riders, um, or it's called an Access Rider, and you can um, get that quite easily from online. And yeah, just just making sure that we're in communication about what those needs are for one another. Brilliant, brilliant. All super valuable information you're, you're giving us there. Thank you so much. Uh, Joe? Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting and it's been really interesting to hear like Elizabeth's point of view as well, because um, again, with the question, there were kind of two ways for me to interpret it. It's as a whole or something that you face individually. Um, and so it's been really interesting to hear two differing perspectives. But I think going back to Andrew's point, you know, ableism for me especially in my experience has been something that's quite prevalent um and I found that it's whilst there can be physical barriers um I feel like this embedded idea of ableism it doesn't allow people to look beyond the physical barriers and think well how can I find a way around that because it's almost like um an assumption is kind of made rather than thinking about how do I I solve this problem um and I think for me the biggest barrier is kind of um and I think for others in sort of my situation as well it's it's attitude and I think if people are willing to um accept that these things do exist you can learn how to change them and I think that applies to everyone's needs like if you're willing to accept that these barriers do exist you can definitely make the positive change needed to be able to say right well now we can make sure that everyone has access to everything mm, yeah most definitely most definitely um alan yeah i, I think in my my experience uh, uh one of the physical barrier the barrier the physical barrier is for example different signs uh different signs, for example, that we can uh, find in, in different uh, walls or different screens to, to know uh, when, we, when we are in uh, places like, the, uh, for example, the, the, the building, we, we sometimes need like, like a science umbrella that could, could say maybe after the lifts, for example. Uh, uh, that say uh, I don't know. For example, if you want to uh, find some places, uh, my my example is for example, uh, if you want to find the music library in the in the opera house, uh, some sign on break break can say can say uh, uh, music library uh, in front at right or in front at, le at left, and other barrier that I find in my experience is. Uh, in English, not not really. It's, this is really great, but uh, we need to call the disability for for the name uh, because in other languages, for example, we we call uh, with uh, with uh, different uh, words, different expression. Uh, the disability, for example, if I am blind, I am blind. But not, uh, say, not not say for example this is an uh, an expression in in, in Spanish uh, I want to translate that but many people say well people who can't see uh, I, I think that we need to uh, we need to call uh, the things for 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 their names uh, 
if you are blind, are blind, or if you can, I don't uh, uh, know, it's necessary uh, to have this accessibility and to find uh, the balance between uh, uh, calling the, the things for their names and, and not in, don't, and really don't feel like people is, um, people is bad with us. I think uh, we need to uh, find this, this balance uh, to be more accessible, uh, uh, both 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 group disability and not disability people. Yeah, great. Yeah, some some really really poignant insights there. Some some great insights there. Thank thank you for that. So uh, the next uh, question is, what does disability inclusive leadership look like in the arts, and how can we nurture and support more disabled leaders within our sector. So I'd like to direct that question um, to Elizabeth first. Yeah, um, so yeah, what does in disability inclusive leadership look like? Yeah, I mean, I think conversations, um, having stimulating conversations, um, you know, that point Alan's making about language and what what we kind of call a disability or, you know, the word disability is is a, a whole, we could spend an hour talking about the word disability and, and the relationship independently that we, we have to that word. And especially for someone who's neurodivergent, you know, my relationship to that word and, um, that's a, a whole big topic of conversation in itself is, is kind of the language that we use, but it's important. And that conversation is important to be had um, in those leadership roles. Um, and, you know, I think speaking to people who, who are, you know, differently abled, um, having conversations directly, I think there's uh, guidelines on employment and recruitment and policies that should be in place. Um, and yeah, there's, there's some fantastic resources out there that you know, everyone should have access to. On our websites, there should be a resource page um, on you know, kind of ha um, big kind of arts organizations that talk about all these um, important uh, resources like the Creative Differences Handbook that Universal Music created. Um, there's the CIPD Neurodiversity at Work, um, which is a really great guideline as well that people should be aware of in, in leadership roles. Um, and yeah, I think just more spaces and hubs that we can have important conversations like this one. Um, and yeah, I think, I think for me, the biggest thing is, is communication. Yeah, definitely. Communication is, is super important and just sharing that knowledge and, and information. Um, Andrew? Well, we, we need some disabled leaders there for a start and they need to be visible. And there really are very few of us in any kind of leadership position. As I said earlier, talent is out there, opportunity isn't. Expectations of disabled people need to be raised by the sector, but also we need to change what the leadership model is itself, because there are huge expectations of leaders today, which might not sit very well when you're managing a very severe disability. So we need to rethink what leadership is, as many of us actually exert influence but have, have no actual power I think we also need to encourage um, our colleagues to come out about disability because whilst the disability-led sector is really very small, Arts Council diversity statistics tell us about 10% of artistic directors declare a disability, 11% uh, of CEOs, which means that disability is much more present in the mainstream industry than it actually appears to be, yet neither, not, neither I nor the industry know who these individuals, uh, many often with invisible disabilities, actually are. So it's important to come out, self-declare, um, and, and talk about disability publicly, uh, because we need more voices, we need more advocacy uh, to embody our, our true strength in the sector. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. And like, it's a really interesting um, point you make about um, leadership and, you know, the, the current models of leadership that, that are in place and things like that. I think the leadership models have, ta- have taken us to a certain point, but in order for us to really move forward progressively, we really need to explore different forms of leadership that actually has space for, for everybody to, to, be a part, to be a part of that. Um, Alan? I'm going to say uh, the, the point of, 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 of Elizabeth and Andrew. They think exactly we need more communication, more uh, and, and talk about more more public about about disability. And I want to share when communication, when as Elizabeth said, when communication is the I think the 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 the, the main thing between disabled and not disabled people. We can we can we can really uh, do uh, great great things, and I want to share this experience when we performed uh, Magic Flute. Uh, um, when we did, when we had uh, a chat about how can we work uh, on stage, we found the great idea to have a earpiece. Uh, on stage and um, uh, all the people that uh, was with uh, with me in that moment uh, we, we and, and and me we were trying to find this uh, these different ways to uh, to work uh, in a good good experience for them and for me in this case so I am totally agree with uh, my, my colleagues in, in this in this panel that communication and talk about uh, disability without uh, without feel scare uh, could be really really great because um, in in this in this way we can really find more inclusive um, inclusive spaces for for all all the people. Yeah, definitely. I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. Um, Joe? Yeah, so it's. I'm going to kind of pick up on what both Andrew and Alan were saying, and I totally agree. And, you know, it, it was interesting that Andrew said something about people don't declare their disabilities. Um, and, you know, that that if you think about it, that's quite shocking because you should feel like you're in a safe enough environment to be able to say, look, this is what I need. And this is how we're going to do it to make things better. And I know from my personal experience, I have found that in some environments, that's not been an option for me. So I've had to, you know, keep things back. And, you know, there have been times when I've been quite open with um, some of my bosses. And, you know, sometimes the reactions that you get are, are, are not the best. And that makes you feel like, you know, if you're not going to advocate for me, then... I have to advocate for myself for everything. And I think that's something that people with who do not experience different accessible needs, you know, they, they don't understand Like you have to keep advocating for yourself all the time and be like, you know, I have to fight for this. And sometimes if you come up against someone who doesn't really understand that and creates a, an environment that doesn't feel safe, that can be really difficult as well. But I think going forward we definitely want to have more open honest conversations and we need to learn from each other um and I really do think that by sharing these lived experiences that we all have in these panels you know that could do some good especially if you want to think about having more disabled leaders in the inclusive arts sector because hopefully by sharing all these lived experiences the next generation who are going to come up, they won't encounter any of these issues. And I think that is the main driving force, you know, towards the future. Yeah, definitely. We've got, we got to make it better for the, for the future generations to come, 100%. And so would you say that it's, it's then super important for, for example, when you're trying to communicate to somebody who is, is not listening, do you, do you feel this is super important to have people backing you up and advocating for you as, as, as well, just to the point so that that power that be has no choice but to listen? Yes, um, definitely. And 
it, it, for me, I think it's kind of been one of two ways. So when I first encountered some of the problems that I was having at work where, you know, they weren't listening and, and things were being quite difficult, I, you know, went to them from quite a genuine place and, you know, some of the things <laughs> that were kind of thrown back at me, they'd make your hair turn grey, you know, with the shock kind of thing. But, um, you know, so I, it is important to have someone there that can also advocate for you, because I think a lot of the time with anyone with a different accessible need, you just feel like you're fighting like the system all the time. And you, you don't want to do that. You know, you want to have the same opportunities as everyone else. But when you look at others around you and specifically with some of the work I've been doing, I've been the only dancer, you know, with a visible disability in a company. It's it's like they don't they get sort of things a lot easier or it appears that way because they don't have to fight against everything all the time. And it was it was something that I kind of thought as well, like in society, I felt like I've had to, to fight for things but coming into an environment that you that's trying to be integrated, you know, it's new. There probably will be some areas where it's going to be difficult, but you don't want to keep feeling like you have to fight against something. So if you have an open and honest conversation with someone, you expect them to listen to you. And sometimes that doesn't happen. So I do think that having someone there that can advocate for you that has a similar experience or just really does understand that really does help. So I think, again, in terms of disability leadership, as well as having a leader with a visible disability, there also needs to be a, like a support network behind them that really, really understand the changes that need to be made and how things can progress going forward. Yeah, yeah, there definitely does need to be a, a strong support system to enable you know the disabled leaders to to be able to to thrive yeah. in, in their in their leadership roles yeah. um because there's nothing worse than you know people being set up to fail um yeah. so yeah the infrastructure and support systems are, are super important um okay so i'm going to go on to like a couple of uh questions i'm just going to uh, fire at uh, specific individuals uh just looking at time because this is such rich conversation that we're having i could be here all night um <laughs> but yeah you know time isn't always our best friend so uh Andrew, yeah. um, can you uh, please outline the importance of the seven inclusive principles and just talk a little bit about um, what it is for those that may not know? Yeah, sure, Nathan. Uh, it, the, the seven inclusive principles uh, were developed by a consortium of cultural organisations last year in the midst of the pandemic, uh, all related to uh, the Disability Arts Alliance, We Shall Not Be Removed, that, that, that I've set up. The principles were really there to, to support the sector, the, the cultural sector, approach reopening and reopening inclusively, um, specifically of, of disabled people, because we recognised there was a real threat about a two-tier reopening where fit and able uh, uh, non-disabled people would be able to return to cultural participation first and disabled people would be secondary. Now, alas, that has actually happened. Um, and very many disabled people are still not uh, coming out. Um, but the principles speak about the supremacy of the Equality Act in all cultural policy decision making. Uh, they talk about identifying and combating ableism, as I spoke about earlier. They talk about co-production of policy with disabled people. So things not being done to disabled people, but created with us, the necessity for clear and comprehensive information on COVID secure measures, um, and particularly how the customer journey needs to be thoroughly mapped for disabled audiences uh, in this new environment. The principles also considered the necessity of engaging disabled artists uh, and also celebrating disability in the cultural workforce. The principles can be found on the We Shall Not Be Removed website in all accessible formats also contains links to a wide range of free resources to support people at every level in the sector to really get to grips with what best practice looks like. And it's important that everyone from management to programmers, artists, front of house, box office, understand their implications. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that the principles have even been adopted um, by uh, Arts Access Australia and being, de de being deployed at the other side of the world. 
Incredible, incredible. That's having such a profound international impact. That's, that's so brilliant. Um, Elizabeth, um, as a disabled artist, what are your experiences of like working remotely? Um, well, I was, uh, yeah, I think working remotely actually, <laughs> you know, we're often in society, people with invisible disabilities are often navigating problems all the time. Um, and, you know, disabilities of all kinds, we're all navigating different um, issues all the time. And so actually when the lockdown occurred, it was just another problem to have to deal with. And Move Beyond Words was set up in the lockdown. Um, and we did that because we didn't feel there was the support there for people uh, with dyslexia within the arts. And, you know, we are often, um, as Joe was saying, kind of advocating for ourselves and for those changes. And sometimes people don't think to ask if you have any access needs or um, whether things could be altered for any differences within a space. And so, you know, we really wanted to, you know, be that voice that we didn't have when we were, well, we're both professional artists in the industry still, um, but that voice that we didn't feel was there. So the, the podcast is, is there for that resource and to support people um, and the workshops and things like that. So, you know, it was, it was, a time to kind of go within and look at what was missing and to bring something back into the world that was of value. And so that's, that's what we've done during the lockdown. Amazing. Totally, totally brilliant. Um, Alan, what's, um, what's been your experience of uh, working remotely as well, actually? It's, it's, it's not a good experience working remotely. Because, uh, first of all, I, I don't really like it. And, uh, and then I think uh, for, for, um, for, for my, my condition, for the blindness, uh, I, I need and I want to learn uh, different things, touching and feeling with my hands. So... Uh, when we work, uh, when we worked uh, remotely, was was an interest, interesting experience because we could learn other other kinds of work. But uh, I prefer like uh, we did uh, two months ago, and I am doing now uh, here in my in my hometown, uh, working. Uh, I think physically, because um, um, working remotely sometimes is uh, quite difficult, and special when uh, some apps are not able to work uh, with the programs of the phones or of the different devices, uh, because it find special find. Uh, for example, now Zoom, Zoom is very, very accessible. We can have this chat remotely. But uh, at the beginning, it uh, was quite uh, difficult to find uh, how, how, can we, how, how can I connect with uh, all the different colleagues and different things. Uh, because sometimes the, the devices are not um, able to read all the images that we can find special on, inter on internet and on, uh, on, on different uh, applications that just uh, have images and have uh, uh, this, 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 this notes that, that are not uh, possible to describe, describe in, the, in the screens. Mm -hmm. I feel, yeah. Okay, so what, what do you feel could be done then to Im improve um, your experience of working remotely? Uh, find, for example, find uh, this, this connection between the, the colleagues or, or other things to have uh, um, different uh, videos to have these virtual concerts, for example, 
and also now the um, applications that that I can say develop uh, these things. They have uh, uh, different uh, audio descriptions to understand what is happening uh, in 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 the in the meetings or in the different uh, situations that we are working remotely. Great, brilliant. Thank, thanks for that insight. It's super valuable, super valuable. Um, Joe, uh, I'd just like to ask you, like, what has been your experience of access for backstage artists and how does that um, generally like, compare to like front of house experience? Like, are they on a par of each other? Is there a bit of an imbalance? What, what are you feeling? Yeah, so I think from my own personal experience, I felt there was a complete imbalance. Um, so with the tour that we've just done of Giselle, we go to a lot of small theatres and the tech crew would ring up ahead of time and they'd be like, um, is the theatre accessible? You know, we've got a dancer that uses a wheelchair, uses crutches. Um, and they'd be like, yes, yeah, the theatre's accessible. But when they're saying it's accessible, they're referring to the front of house rather than the backstage area. So there's been times where you know, I've had to, someone's had to like carry me up steps, you know, I've had to go up, like sitting down, find some kind of way to do that. Um, you know, the wing space has not been great. So there were, there were lights um, and they always kind of said, you know, if there's any problems, come and speak to the stage manager and we'll see if we can move it. But then there were a couple of occasions where it was like, well, the lights have to be there and they can't be moved. So then it kind of restricted, you know, my access. So for most of the shows and most of the venues that I've done, I've, you know, had to come on and off in the same sort of wing. And obviously when you have other dancers around you as well, you know, they come off different wings and sometimes they've blocked my only access route and you have cables on the floor and that can severely impact you know me coming on with my chair and, and things like that um and and yeah it's there was also one venue that unfortunately I wasn't able to go to at all because it was you know it was completely inaccessible so um that show I had to unfortunately miss so I think the important thing going forward that people need to think about is rather than just thinking about the front of house which I felt sometimes was happening you have to think about you know, the backstage areas as well. Um, yeah, and I think as well, because I also do, you know, use my crutches as well for short distances, there was kind of a, a little bit of a misconception that, you know, well, you can stand up on your crutches, so stairs are not going to be that much difficult for you. But, you know, when I get tired and we have tours and performances, you know, things do become a lot more difficult. So, again, I think, it's about having that open conversation and really sitting down and saying, okay, what do you need for your access requirements and having those really open and honest conversations? Because I know that, especially with some of the theatres we visit, you know, if they were to make it accessible, they'd probably have to do a complete remodel of the building. And I know that that is not going to be a realistic thing that can be done in a short amount of time. So you know, it, it, it's about the communication of booking venues that you know really work very well, um, having that those conversations. And again, just not being afraid to ask questions because I think sometimes there was an assumption made, again, as I said, that I'm on crutches. Sometimes you can get up out your chair and it's like, well, I can't carry my stuff. You know, getting upstairs is not the easiest. So it's it's just it's just having a lot more thought when it comes to things. And I think that's really, really important. Yeah, definitely. You, you hear that, people at home? Or you then you step your backstage access up. Super important, super important. Okay, um, so the last question I'm going to quickly ask you um, before we hand it over to our, uh, our audience for questions is what, what is needed for an inclusive recovery in our, in our sector? Uh, and I'd like to direct this question first to... Andrew, I think we've 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 covered a lot of uh, the ground, but you know this pandemic has really cruelly exposed the full extent of disabled people's fragility in the arts ecosystem, and our continued cultural participation is at real risk. 
So I think, you know, we need these conversations, these kind of discussions we're having tonight, um, but also uh, conversations going on across the industry to ensure that um, disabled people are able to continue uh, to be engaged. We've seen a small number of organizations that the RSC, Battersea Arts Center, prioritize inclusion in their reopening plans, maintaining socially distanced performances or mandating face coverings. And the Arts Council have put a real priority on the reintegration of disabled and CEV people. Um, and I'm really proud of that position. Um, there just needs to be continued thought. The seven principles, I think, offer a good roadmap uh, for the sector itself um, to, to guide its recovery. Great, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth? Yeah, I would, I would add to that um, more data and analytics so that we can back um, our findings in those conversations. And then to take that further, um, you know, to, to really look at ways of, of funding these changes and um, that needs to be having by, by our big arts organizations, which I know a lot of places are, um, but yeah, there, there could be more of it. Great, Thank, thanks for that. Uh, Alan? I am re I agree with, the, with my colleagues. It's keep keep with the, with the conversations because I think so far we have a lot of uh, improve, uh, improves in the accessibility in, in the sector. Uh, we have uh, different uh, ways to arrive um, to the um, uh, performance, but we need to keep with uh, these chats, with this, um, with, with this communication and um, talk about different uh, suggestions that we can find uh, together uh, with uh, all, all the people that we're working uh, day by day. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, Joe? Yeah, so I think following on from everyone's points, I think it's definitely the open communication. I think all of us in this panel have completely different and unique and really valid experiences. So I think it's really important that organisations, you know, you speak to as many different people as possible because one person's experience is not going to be the same as someone else's. So it's almost like you need to understand the different spectrum of different needs. But I think on a more general note, and again, it's going back to sort of ending this ableism culture, because I think, you know, it does exist with someone who has... Um, physical accessible needs but I'm sure as well you know it exists with someone who has an invisible disability you know I think it I think it exists within all different accessible needs and I think at the root of it there needs to be more of an understanding and a little bit more empathy to understand that each person's lived experience is so unique and incredibly valid and, you know, if if you come to someone and you're trying to advocate for yourself, you're not doing it in a way to, you know, be antagonistic. You are genuinely trying to have the same opportunities as everyone else and genuinely trying to push forward for a better future for everyone. So I think as well, if you can see someone that's, even if it's the smallest change, attempting and trying to make those steps, that goes a long way. And, you know, it, it's not going to be right all the time mistakes will be made but I think all of us are willing to accept that if you try and put those principles in place you know it's a starting point we have somewhere to go with this so I think it's making the attempts to change and having those open and honest conversations so you you build on that knowledge of empathy that of the experiences that we all have yeah definitely like empathy is super important and also the fact that everybody's experience is unique and valid like that's that's super important we need to like hold that in the forefront of our minds at all times um great what we're going to do now is we're going to go over to the audience so they can answer some of these well so you can answer some of their questions i guess um don't feel you all you every single person has to answer these questions but i'm just going to open the floor up so you can all chime in however, however you like with the, with these questions so the first question is from elena and she says, um, what are your recommendations 
or best ways for somebody with a disability to get involved in the arts to develop their skills? I mean, I'm, I can come from um, a neurodivergent perspective. Um, I think, you know, just taking that step. And I think, you know, a lot of people with dyslexia, ADHD, autism um, are kind of channeled into a creative career. Um, and I think that's great. You know, there's so many things that assets that we have as people who are neurodivergent that can offer so much to the creative sector. Doesn't mean that you have to go into a creative sector. And I think that's really important to stress. You know, there are incredible scientists, um, you know, people, people doing all types of jobs who have dyslexia and neurodivergent tendencies. So you don't have to go into a creative career. And I think that's, I really want to stress that. Um, but if you do go into a creative career, there are a lot of challenges. Um, and I think they're often not spoken about and not given a platform to, um, but they are manageable. And there are spaces that um, can offer offer those support you know that handbook that I mentioned at the beginning the creative differences is a brilliant handbook um, we as move beyond words are here to support those who have um, who, who are neurodivergent and neurodiverse so you know reach out and um, we'd be happy to support brilliant thank you thank you so much okay the next question is from Kyra and she says uh, how can people with disabilities be better represented in classical ballet also also on stage yeah so I think for me in classical ballet there is definitely a big gap at the moment and I think I'm quite lucky and unique in the fact that before I acquired my disability I was able to do um, vocational ballet training um, and this is something that that's talked about quite a lot. Um, there's absolutely a lack of people willing to train dancers in the classical ballet technique who have a difference. And I think it, it comes from sort of the root of kind of how it was founded. I think people have this idea that classical ballet is only for a select group of people. And I think people need to look at it and think, you know, we need to get this into the 21st century, We, you know, because otherwise, if we don't do something where dancers represent the population of people in our world today, people are going to lose interest in it. And I think, especially in ballet, that is something that, that we don't want to happen anyway, because there's so many stereotypes that people see that, the you know, they try and dismiss it and, you know, it's the hairy fairy and it's this and it's that. Um, so I think going forward, we the representation, you know, we want to see more dancers there. You know, I'm as much as I can reaching out to as many companies to kind of see if, it, if it's something that they're interested in. But I think at the root of it, there needs to be more training opportunities. And regardless of where the people are going to pursue this as a professional career or not, you know, Ballet and dance has so many, you know, physical and social benefits to everyone, even if it's something that you're not going to pursue as a career later on down the line. I think you will take something away from it. So I think at the root of it, we need to get training there to be able to get the next generation of dancers there. And also don't be afraid to put dancers, you know, with visible differences in lead roles, because I think there's a little bit of hesitancy around that sometimes, but there shouldn't be. And I think going forward, those are the things that are really important. Yeah, totally, totally, totally agree. Um, and actually, your, your response kind of leans into the, the next question, which is from uh, Caitlin. And Caitlin says, what would you recommend to instructors or studio owners to make class more accessible and inclusive? How would you advise they talk to their disabled students? Uh, they go on to say that they had some really cool te teachers as a, as a child yeah that's that's quite common I think you know and and even now you know that there, there are certain directors in certain companies that would look at you and be like you shouldn't be doing ballet you know you shouldn't be doing any type of dance because you're just not the right person 
Um, and I think there's this wonderful thing in ballet. Um, someone introduced it to me. So I've been in contact um, with a lady who's had a similar experience to me where she trained classically and then her, acquired her disability and she's guested with various ballet companies, but now she's moved into sort of like a mentorship role. Um, and she was involved with this amazing project. It's called Universal Design of Instruction. So you really look um, at classwork in, in ballet in particular, the focus was on, but I think it, it works in any style of dance. And you look at the form and the function of class so for someone with a who uses a wheelchair or you know uses crutches or a walking frame, each translation of the movement is going to be completely different. But you look at the commonalities that you share. So for example, if you were to do a class and you're thinking about jumping, and you, I when I first heard that, I was like, well, how am I going to do that in my chair? But then you think jumping the preparation is you know a release from the floor so how can I interpret that differently so I think if there are people out there willing to look at this universal approach you know we'll be at the beginning of something it probably will take a while to get there but it, it, it'll make things easier um so yeah so if anyone is interested look up online the universal design of instruction um, and also Dance Unstuck, because there's some fabulous um, resources on there that, that, you know, shows the beginning of some really exciting things. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, some, some, some great examples there. Thank, thank you so much. OK, so it's uh, coming to the, the end of our discussion, I'm, I'm afraid, my people. Um, like I said, I could, I could stay here like for, for an extra few hours, literally just um, listening to all your in insights. They've all been super valuable. Um, so can I just have kind of like one final um, word from each of you? It doesn't have to be a, a, a single word, but like a, a final, I guess, statement or recommendation in terms of what it is that we could do to move towards um, an inclusive, um, an, an inclusive uh, future regarding specifically uh, disability within the arts. And can we go to Alan first? Thank you. I, I, I think that I, I want to remember some, some uh, phrase of one of my coaches uh, of the Opera House that uh, one day when we was, was working in, 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 in space, we, uh, he, he said that we need to listen all our bodies and all our persons. I think to becoming more inclusive, uh, more accessible, the things we need to develop all the senses. I mean, we know that we have some different conditions, but we need to open the universe because everyone, not just us, everyone uh, have the, uh, has different, different maybe maybe disabled, like for example, Giuseppe Verdi, when Verdi was in the conservatory, Verdi really couldn't uh, play the piano because uh, he had a problem in, 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 in his hand. So. I think we need to open the universe to all the senses, to all the senses to create more uh, space between all of, of it, between each other and, uh, and to find um, very new experience and, and find uh, interesting things that we can create because it's very, very interesting with the, when the uni when the universe is, open for all the people, for people with disability or with no disability. Yeah, super important to connect with the universe and, and make sure that everybody's open to that and therefore we'll be open to each other a lot more so. Beautiful. Uh, Elizabeth? I would say, I mean, I, I completely agree with Alan and, and just thinking beyond yourself you know, putting yourself in someone else's situation and thinking about how am I navigating my way around this website? Is it accessible for someone who may um, have a learning difference? You know, am I, am I using accessible language? Um, I, I think, yeah, just thinking beyond yourself and, and putting yourself in someone else's position who, yeah, is, is differently abled um, is, is so important. Um, I, I think some things that 
are are not thought about um, in terms of a studio. The question before about um, accessible studio spaces, you know, people with autism, it, it massively affects the sound quality in a space. So am I accommodating the way that the sound is in, in that space? And is it too bright? Um, you know, and they're just questions that can be asked to that individual. It, it doesn't have to be about kind of redesigning everything in the studio, but, you know, is this working for you? And, and again, that comes back to what I kind of started with and it's communication, just clear communication. Definitely. Yeah. The more we communicate, the more we'll connect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, Andrew? I'd just like to remind everyone that at the beginning of this pandemic, um, disabled people were on the cusp of a real breakthrough. Our plays were on at the National Theatre. Um, uh, we were on the in the West End. Our art was in exhibition halls up and down the country. Um, uh, you know, the UK was a global leader in, in inclusive arts. And so I think it's really important that we all work together, artists, audiences, to really fight to ensure that we regain that position, to ensure that we don't become less diverse with fewer disabled artists, employees and audience and risk becoming more ableist. So it, it's important that we all commit to creating a more inclusive society, a more inclusive industry, because on the other side, quite frankly, we will all have been through too much to allow the old discriminatory barriers re-emerge to prevent inclusion. Yeah, super, super poignant that, that, you know, the fact that, you know, we were on the, you know, we were global leaders in terms of, you know, inclusivity and, and accessibility, you know, that's, that's absolutely incredible. And that's something that we should be proud of. So we have to make sure that when we move forwards, we, we can not only achieve that, but go beyond that. Because if 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 we don't, sorry, but quite frankly, I think we as a as a as a nation, we sh we should be ashamed of ourselves if we can't get ourselves to that point again. Then yeah, some you know something you know dramatic really need, really needs to to change. Um, and Joe, yeah. So I think the thing to think about moving forward is nothing is impossible. So it's almost like think that the impossible is impossible. Uh, is possible sorry um you know don't look at okay this can't be done and that can't be done look at what can be done to make changes and what can be done you know it might look a little different to what we're used to seeing but that's the exciting thing you know tr stepping into this territory of something that's new and it hasn't been done before that's really really exciting and you know we should celebrate that um and yeah that's just amazing and also thank you as well yeah yeah no thank thank you so much yeah like uncertainty it's it's a scary place it's a scary place for people but it can also be a beautiful place and lead us to some incredible things you know yeah. so i think you know we we stand to gain a lot more <laughs> from embracing uncertainty uh, than we do to kind of like clinging on to certainty and the, the old ways and the safe ways and things like that. I think, you know, the more we can actually go out there and try new things that hasn't been done before, try new aesthetics, the, you know, the, the much richer, you know, our sector and, uh, and, other, and other sectors um, will, will, will be for that. Uh, so, yeah, I'd just like to say uh, massive respect and Big thank you to our panelists. You have all been absolutely incredible. Super inspired by you guys. Next level. Next level, my people. Uh, sorry, you're getting me all excited. Yeah, just, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for being, you know, so open and honest, um, you know, and, and sharing such valuable, valuable information. Um, I'd just like to you thank uh, the Royal Opera House, the BSL interpreters, everybody on this team that have worked really hard uh, to bring to you uh, insights tonight. I've been Nathan Gearing. I just want to say thank you so much. One love, peace. <laughs>